Hello, Thrive Nation. We've got the most incredible cardiologist, Dr. Michael Twyman, on the show today. I've been listening to him for a while. We're going to link to a fantastic podcast that he did with Dr. Gabriel uh, Lyon, I think, and uh, a friend of his and just someone that I really respect as well. He's been in the space. He's a preventative cardiologist. Dr. Twyman.com is his website. It's filled with incredible information, testing. He's known as the red light doc as well. So I really want to welcome a very unique, courageous cardiologist because he's really looked at preventative medicine regarding heart attacks and heart disease. So welcome to the show. Thank you very much for inviting me today. Brilliant. Now, Dr. Michael Twyman, please, we want stories that people can relate to, the audience and viewers on YouTube, that they can sort of like connect with, that there's an emotional connection to someone that they might can relate to with regards to preventative cardiologists. Something that they can do, whether it's photobiomodulation, whether it's grounding, whether it's nutrition, whether it's exercise, give us two cool stories that people can really engage with. Well, the first real good one is that actually a patient I just saw yesterday it was a, a gentleman in his upper 40s, and he was interested in heart attack prevention. He had some risk factors, high cholesterol, which we'll, I'm sure we'll get into that, you know, heart disease is much more than just high cholesterol. But the patient actually was, you know, wise enough to go get a test called the CT coronary calcium scan, which is a low dose you know, radiation scan that looks for calcifications in your heart arteries. And he had an extremely high score for somebody who was in his upper 40s. Uh, and he had seen the traditional cardiologist and they said, well, here's a aspirin statin. And if you have chest pain, you should just go to the ER. Well, that's not good enough. You know, you got to get to the root cause. Why did this guy who's less than 50 years old have such, you know, severe plaque in his arteries? And so we've done some extensive blood work and genetic testing, and we actually figured out exactly why he has it. He has LPLA plus a few other things. But in the interim, while we were working him up, his mother actually just suffered sudden cardiac death. She died from a heart attack. Wow. So if he would have just waited around until he had symptoms, he could have been another victim. And so I just want to get the message out there that heart attacks are common, but they're definitely preventable. And you can find them, you know, the things that lead to heart attacks 20 years before you ever have symptoms. So that's my major story is that heart attacks are preventable. And I know we'll get into all the circadian biology and the quantum health and the biohacking stuff. Those are all yeah. important, but the whole goal of those things are to keep your heart healthy so you can do the things that you want to do. Okay. Maybe you've got a story of someone that like you did an assessment on and then they got out into the sun, you know, they were able to change their biology through a circadian rhythm or they've improved their sleep with some red light or photobiomodulation because people are like, I'm going to ask you the next question. What's the most important thing as a cardiologist that you tell your patients? I know the answer to that, but let's hear a story possibly of someone that you did tell this very important thing to and it changed their lives. Sure. I mean, it's probably a kind of a combination of multiple people's stories, but I always start with circadian biology and I teach people, you know, going out in the morning sun to set their, you know, their circadian rhythms, you know, that light hitting your eyes you know, turning on the supercosmic nucleus and telling the rest of the body how to make your hormones and neurotransmitters. So I always work on that first, but I've had numerous people that when I teach them that, you know, simple tip and then really block the artificial light at night, their sleep quality tends to improve. And, you know, I have somewhat of a biased population where people are coming to me looking for prevention. So a lot of them have sleep trackers and such, and they always notice that their, you know, deep and REM sleep improve when they start these simple, you know, circadian rhythm biohacks. Now link that Dr. Michael Twyman, because you're a cardiologist and you've had a lot of experience. You've seen, you know, thousands of patients. You do all these tests that we're going to talk about, but link how important the circadian rhythm is and your sleep, your deep, your REM to heart health. Sure. I mean, one of the things that people monitor frequently is their blood pressure and your blood pressure has a diurnal rhythm. You know, your blood pressure starts increasing, you know, around 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. You know, as cortisol starts rising, getting you ready to wake you up for the day. And, you know, you're pumping blood to your brain and your muscles so you can go out and hunt, but your blood pressure should kind of start drifting down in the evening time once you fall asleep. If it doesn't, and you're what's considered a non-dipper, your risk of heart attack and stroke starts increasing. Sure. And there's, you know, a device called the 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor that can give you an average of your blood pressure over the day, but it actually can see that circadian rhythm of your blood pressure. 
Sure, oh, that sounds no, that sounds important. You know, in South Africa, eighty percent of the population over the age of fifty has hypertension. I mean, Africans listening to that, eighty percent of people, four out of five in a line in South Africa have high blood pressure, and so I think that's crucially important. Now, you're also a biohacker, so tell us about the biohacks when it comes to blood pressure. I know we're going to sort of divert a little bit, but I think that's important because circadian rhythm, getting the right light, releasing nitric oxide which reduces you know blood pressure high blood pressure is so important what about the biohacks of people actually taking their blood pressure with these units are they accurate are they should people go out and get a home unit and track their blood pressure at night i didn't realize how important it was that they were if you're non non dipper that's like crucially important Right. And, you know, blood pressure is one of 400 things that can drive atherosclerosis or plaque forming in your arteries. And high blood pressure, sometimes I joke is that it's not really a disease. It's something going wrong in your environment that isn't allowing your arteries to fully relax and improve blood flow. And often that is a nitric oxide story. So you had mentioned, you know, sunlight is one of the things. It's the UVA wavelengths of light hitting your skin, causes the blood vessels to come to the surface and release nitric oxide. But from the biohacking world, it's really the photobiomodulation or red light therapy, as some people want to call it. It's when that red light penetrates into the mitochondria, it knocks nitric oxide off the four cytochrome, and then that nitric oxide diffuses to the muscle and the artery wall and relaxes it, improving flow. So red light therapy is something that potentially can be useful to help lower blood pressure, but you always have access to the sun. And so if you have, you know, say you have four out of your five people in your local environment have high blood pressure, it's often a sun deficiency first. And then you do some, you know, blood work to figure out is there some nutrient or mineral deficiency or something else that you can do to support the body. Brilliant. And what about these devices? Are they accurate? I mean, I've tried them. Sometimes if I compare them, you know, to my office here and the practice that's been going for 23 years, some of them are accurate, some aren't accurate, some of them are precise, meaning they make the same errors. Uh, should people sort of look at the trends of these blood pressure monitors that they can buy at the pharmacies? Or is it not valuable to them? No, it's it's a great question. And, and it is, I'm not gonna say it's really complicated, but, you know, pick a device, you know, there's some companies that make some better ones and it depends on what you have access to, but you know, you want to check first in both arms and I should probably kind of back up a little bit. Like how do you actually check an accurate blood pressure? Yeah. So ideally you're going to have a brachial cuff. So you want something that's on your bicep. You, all the ones that are on your wrist are high, generally very inaccurate. They can be 20, 30 points off too high, 20, 30 points off too low. So you want a blood pressure cuff that fits on your bicep area. You would generally want to do the test at the same time of day initially, you may want to check it multiple times a day, but start with you know one time a day initially. And you want to be resting for a few minutes, maybe up to five minutes before you actually check the blood pressure. You want to be caffeine-free, nicotine-free, alcohol-free at that moment. You want to be sitting in a chair with your back supported, your feet on the ground. You want your arm at heart level, so resting on a table, and then check the blood pressure. Now, you know, per guidelines, you should be checking it like two to three times in that five minute period and then averaging it out, but probably would check it twice in the same arm and average that number out. But a good tip is that you wanna check it in both arms initially to see, is there a difference in your blood pressure in your left arm versus your right arm? Because in some instances, if the blood pressure is 20 points higher in one arm, that can be a marker that you have a blockage in your subclavian artery going to the other arm, you're gonna get a falsely low blood pressure in that arm. Some of those people have symptoms. They'll get kind of pain in their arms and they're, you know, doing exercise or lifting the hand up over their head. Um, but if you have blockages in that artery, you very likely have blockages elsewhere. So you want to make sure your blood pressure is the same in both arms, and then you can check it on whatever arm is the highest. But one tip too is take your home device to your provider and have them calibrate it. You know, what does your home values look like compared to their office machine? And honestly, if your office machine, you know, isn't a manual blood pressure, at least as a backup, they're probably doing it wrong. You know, a lot of the automated machines, you know, if you don't calibrate them, they'll get off base. So, you know, unfortunately, a lot of times people go to the doctor's office, they just run in from the parking lot. Somebody slaps a blood pressure cup on them, hits a button, says your blood pressure is high. Well, you have to let that person rest for a few minutes. And ideally you do it manually with a blood pressure cuff, use a stethoscope, listen to the blood rushing back into the artery. And ideally it'd be a mercury, you know, tube. Those are a little bit harder to find now. I was able to find a few off of uh, some interesting sites uh, from overseas and do have some of the old school mercury, mm. you know, blood pressure monitors. And that can actually be, you know, highly accurate. And then you can compare, you know, what the mercury cuff is to the one that your home is and give you kind of a calibration factor. 
Brilliant. Now that we're on sort of self-assessments, where would you place that in terms of important, in terms of uh, self-assessments or self-quantification? We do a lot of corporate work, just come from the biggest bank in Africa now, doing a lot of their exco. We use sleep tracking devices, which we can talk about a little later. But how important is it for someone over the age of even 30 or 40 to check their blood pressure regularly? I think it's fairly critical. I mean, it's just a simple, easy, cheap way to assess What's going on with the 60,000 miles of blood vessels you got? You know, if you have high blood pressure, it's like the check engine light in your car went on. You got to figure out why the blood pressure is elevated. You know, again, it's not a disease, but if your blood pressure is, you know, north of 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury, you're going to really start increasing the risk of stroke, heart attack, kidney failure. Those high shear stresses are damaging the arteries. And you got to figure out what's causing that. Now, there's mm. multiple reasons, but, you know, if you can check something and, you know, do something about it years before you have an event, it's worthwhile. You know, yeah, definitely I know we'll get into sleep trackers. Sleep is critically important, but some of those sleep trackers, you know, sometimes cause uh, more insomnia when you start, you know, freaking out about all the numbers on those things. But the blood pressure is a pretty straightforward. You know, it's either yeah. less than 120 over 80 or it's not. Brilliant. And, and what about the sort of latest research possibly coming out that 120, 80, sometimes on a little on the high side, you should really look at an optimal sort of BP of 110, 70. Correct. You know, that, that's a great point. So, you know, that's more out of the kind of the sprint trial that, you know, if you're on treatment, you know, medications, you're probably wanting to shoot for 120 over 80, unless you're extremely elderly, you know, multiple risk of falls and, you know, multiple comorbidities, maybe you're not pushing that aggressive. But yes, you're right. You know, a quote, normal blood pressure is really 110 over 70 or less, but you're not recommending people take medications to try to drive them down that low. Brilliant. Now, you're a cardiologist. You see a lot of patients. You've been working. What is the most important steps that someone listening out here that can prevent cardiovascular disease or treat cardiovascular disease? You say you prevent heart attacks and reverse heart disease. Where do they start with regards to looking at exercise, nutrition, circadian biology? What is the most important thing they can do today? I mean, start with the circadian biology side of the things. I mean, you know, we evolved under full power light. So using the sun to time your, you know, hormones and neurotransmitters is always going to be key. You know, that's free information, you know, go outside, see if, you know, five, 10, 15 minutes of the sun, you know, bare eyes to the skies, you know, ideally try to be barefoot if you can be earthing and grounding and then really limit your artificial light, especially at nighttime. You know, we're both wearing the blue blocking glasses to filter out some of the light hitting that melanopsin receptor in the back of our eye. That stuff is generally cheap or very inexpensive to do. But then to get into the heart attack prevention side of things, it's really about endothelial health. The endothelium is the inner lining of your arteries. It's one cell thick. Your endothelium is about the surface area of six tennis courts. So it's one of your largest secretory organs. And people who develop atherosclerosis always start with endothelial dysfunction first. So something damages this thin lining, you know, it can be infections, it can be high insulin, high glucose, you know, there's multiple things that can damage it, but once it's damaged, the lining of the artery releases less nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is a short-lived molecule that signals different things in the body, but inside the artery wall, it causes the artery wall to relax. So that improves the flow down the artery. So that's going to keep blood pressure normal, but that nitric oxide also has kind of like a non-stick surface. So the white blood cells, the lipoproteins that are ferrying the cholesterol and triglycerides around your system, they just slide right through and they don't stick to the artery wall. If you have endothelial dysfunction, that can precede plaque formation by 10, 20 years. So there's different testing you look at. Some are blood markers, some are non-invasive devices that look at elasticity of the arteries. And you can see, you know, do you have endothelial dysfunction? If the answer is yes, then you got to, you know, do the root cause analysis. Why do you have endothelial dysfunction? Brilliant. So let's go into a little bit of the testing because you got obviously that coronary calcium score, which is important. You do the endopack test in terms of the endothelial function. I think you said there's possibly a home device, a biohacking device, which I think is crucially important. And then you do the CIMT test. Is that correct in your office? And then you've got the clearly test as well. So from a cardiology point of view, we do have a lot of medical professionals that listen to the podcast. Take us through how important the testings are, where you start and what age are you starting at? Because it seems, it seems that cardiovascular disease, we're losing the battle, it still causes the number one deaths in sort of Western countries worldwide. I think somewhere around 18 million deaths a year. The next is cancer. I think somewhere around 10 million, if I'm, you know, I could be off on the stats, but somewhere around there, we're obviously losing the battle to ASCVD look at the testing 
Why are we missing it? And what tests need to be done? No, it's such a great and important question. And atherosclerosis starts almost in utero, but it really starts kicking off in your teens and 20s. You know, there's autopsy studies from, you know, veterans from the Korean War and uh, the Gulf War who died in battle. And these young gentlemen had fatty streaks in the aorta. You know, these are precursors to developing plaques in the coronary arteries, the carotid arteries. So it starts very young. And, you know, while I'm an integrative preventive cardiologist, you know, I sometimes joke, you know, the goal is, you know, you don't want to meet your cardiologist on the way to the cath lab when you're having the heart attack. You'd like to meet me you know, do the root cause analysis, like say, if we do these things, you're not ending up with a stent mm -hmm. or bypass surgery. But honestly, there should be pediatric preventive cardiologists because it starts that early. So some of the lipid metrics wow. like lipoprotein little a, which 20% of the population has, you know, that should be checked, you know, when you're teenage years, you know, if it's normal, it's always gonna be normal. But if it's high, those people need to be watched a little bit more closely because they're at more risk of developing intimal swelling, more plaque formation and such. But you know, that's kind of more biomarkers would be in your 20s and 30s. So cut off of usually about 40 is when I start recommending some of the testing that, you know, would involve radiation, you know, because it's always risk versus benefit. Um, you know, you know, sometimes people wait for certain cancers until they're too large. So you want to look for atherosclerosis before you have the symptoms. Okay. I kind of sometimes describe it as, you know, like stops on the subway station. So you look way upstream for the endothelial dysfunction. That's the testing, like you'd mentioned, the endopad. The endopad's a non-invasive 15-minute test. That's like a stress test for your arteries to tell you, well, how much nitric oxide can your arteries make when they're under stress? There's a test called Max Pulse. There's some other names for it, but it's like pulse wave velocity. It looks like a pulse oximeter, put on your finger, and it's measuring the elasticity of the arteries, so how springy are the arteries. Healthy arteries should expand and contract like an accordion. Uh, we do this on every patient that comes and sees me in the office. If you have elastic arteries, you generally have good nitric oxide levels and things aren't likely sticking to your arteries. If you have arteries like a lead pipe, the you know the test will be very uh, abnormal. You have a type six or seven artery and you gotta figure out, okay, why is that artery so stiff? There is somewhat of a home version of this. Moby makes a watch that can do some of it. I haven't found it to be super sensitive compared to the devices that I have. Um, it doesn't always pick up. So maybe with a firmware upgrade, maybe it'll eventually work a little bit better, but maybe I'll start putting that on my Instagram stories, you know, when it starts mm -hmm. looking like it's working a little bit better, but there's devices that can look at that elasticity. So that's like the earliest signs. Like I said, that can start in your twenties or thirties, but then the test that I often recommend yearly for people, you know, starting after maybe 35 years old is the carotid intimal medial thickness test. So when that test is performed, it's an ultrasound of the artery on the side of your neck. You know, in the old world in cardiology, you know, they're looking for severe stenosis. You know, if somebody puts a stethoscope on their neck and they hear a brewery or turbulent flow, it's like, you know, putting your finger over a garden hose and hearing the water whoosh through it. Mm. Well, they're going to send you for a carotid duplex and they're going to say you have a less than 50%, a 50 to 70% blockage or greater than 70%. Okay, you're really late to the game. Well, with the carotid intimal medial thickness test, which is using similar ultrasound technology, they just use a different software package and they're measuring the inner lining of the artery behind that endothelium. The intima should be fairly thin, less than half a millimeter. If the intima is thickened, then that's a marker that there's inflammation in the intima. And that means that those ApoB containing particles, the cargo ships that are carrying your cholesterol and triglycerides, they're kind of getting stuck in the artery and your body's starting a war with the immune system there. That's a you know, marker that if that swelling doesn't stop, you're going to be on the progress to developing softer plaque in the arteries. And the credit intimal medial thickness test, we'll see the soft plaque if it's present. That's what you're usually concerned about is the soft plaque. The soft plaque is the plaques that tend to be more vulnerable or more likely to rupture. And when they rupture, they form a clot. So if it clots here, it causes a stroke. If it clots in your heart, it causes a heart attack. So the soft plaque is extremely important. And you had mentioned a test called the CT coronary calcium scan. That's a great test, but it's a late finding that when the arteries start to calcify, calcium is supposed to be in your bones and teeth. It's not supposed to be in your arteries. Calcium is a repair process. So you've had all these break-ins to the artery. The immune system has been activated. Your body's trying to basically seal off this abscess in the artery wall and it'll become fibrosed and ultimately calcified. So if you do a CT coronary calcium score over the age of 40, your score should be zero if you're near 40. That means you're not late to the game. You don't have severe plaques in the arteries likely. If you have a calcium score over zero, that means you do have plaque in the arteries. The higher the score, the higher the risk. I recently had a gentleman with the highest score I'd ever seen. So for comparison, you know, a score over 400 is considered high risk. A score over 1,000 is considered very high risk. 
This individual had a score of 7,000. So we're in the process of working them up. Why is it so severe? Fortunately, he's asymptomatic, so we have some time to do the workup. So don't think necessarily he's headed towards bypass surgery, but if he didn't get that test, he would not know that he was in that really high-risk bucket. So the calcium score test is a great kind of on-off switch. You're either low risk or you're higher risk. And then- But it doesn't measure you, the soft clock. That's why you need the CIMT. Correct. Exactly. And that's the that's the downside on the calcium score test is that, you know, if there's calcium present, then you know there's also soft plaque present. It's probably two thirds to three quarters of the plaque is still going to be soft. So if you just see the hard calcified plaque, you know that, okay, you got some work to do. Um, and so sometimes you'll see this on social media, these guys change up their diets and they have lipids that look horrendous to a traditional doctor. And they say, well, my calcium score is zero. So there can't be any problems. Like, well, you might be missing all the soft plaque. Yeah. So if they have endothelial dysfunction and intimal swelling, that diet probably is not right for that individual. Mm. But the newer test that um, is rolling out and I've been using for about a year now is the, the clearly scan. The clearly scan is a AI machine learning uh, software package that basically interprets a regular CT coronary angiogram. So the difference between a CT angiogram and a calcium score test is that the calcium score test is a quote dry scan and the CT angiogram is a wet scan, meaning you have to have an IV placed and they administer IV contrast. So they basically light up the inside of the lumen where the blood is flowing so they can take a picture and see how much stenosis you have. But that's not really the benefit of the clearly scan because if somebody's having symptoms, they're really late to the game and there's other tests you can kind of do to determine you know, how bad the, the stenosis is. But the benefit of the clearly scan is that it's quantifying the amount of plaque in the artery wall. So again, think of like a garden hose and you slice the garden hose in half and you're looking at the wall thickness and you're looking at if there's plaque present. It's kind of like a iceberg. You know, all that iceberg is, you know, in the artery wall and only the tip of the iceberg points down into the lumen and obstructs flow. So you get a score called the total plaque volume and it'll tell you, okay, X percent of it is calcified, X percent of it is soft plaque and, you know, X percent of it is this low density soft plaque. And it tends to be those low density soft plaques are the, you know, the, uh, the necrotic plaques, the ones that are more likely to rupture and cause events. So this test, it's, literally just rolling out right now, uh, kind of all over the place. Um, they're getting some really good uh, correlation with, um, you know, events. So, you know, if you have a low score, less than 250, not a lot of risk of having heart attacks. You have a score over 750, pretty high risk. You're going to have some events. So that data is going to start rolling out over the next couple of years. So if you're really an advanced biohacker, look for the clearly scan. Brilliant. So those are the four tests, Dr. Michael, in terms of uh, now the recent one. The, the CIMT, does that take uh, quite a lot of skill? Is that readily really available with cardiologists? I'm not sure if you've got colleagues in South Africa or Africa. Is this something that is still developing or is it sort of well known with a lot of research and a lot of meta-analyses? It's well known. It's been around for you know a good 20 years, but it is not always rolled out to all the uh, uh, locales. I mean, because people are used to the carotid duplex looking for severe stenosis. So it requires a particular type of software package. But at least here in the States, you know, there's you know two or three companies that offer mobile CIMP services to doctor's offices. So you just batch up 10 or 15 patients, say like, I'm interested in these people scanned. And then these imaging center uh, companies fly into your area and then scan everybody. And they send a, um, a vascular tech who that's their you know, full-time job doing the scans. And then a radiologist will do the, the calculations and the measurements and then send you back the report. Um, and then there are other devices where there's a um, basically a, uh, running video that you can do. So if somebody has some ultrasound you know, skills, I'm still bored in echocardiography. So I've you know, held the probe for a couple thousand hours in my life. It's not too challenging to take some pictures. And then you send the pictures out and then the, uh, uh, the vascular techs and the radiologists actually take the measurements. So it is you know, available, but you just have to search for it. And it's called a carotid intimal medial thickness or CIMT for short. TMT. Okay, let's move on to sort of blood markers as a cardiologist, the most important blood markers, maybe you can do a little bit of a sort of a lipid masterclass on APOB and APOA, the difference, and you mentioned lipoprotein little a that many, many docs don't check and how important that is, in terms of, you know, preventing heart disease and treating heart disease, what are the top maybe 10 blood tests that are crucially important to have a look at? And that is also a great question because most people will get a traditional cholesterol panel. Maybe they get a vitamin D, a hemoglobin A1C, and just a TSH, and they're told everything looks good. Those are good starting points. But again, there's three to 400 different things that can impact the artery's health. 
And so I usually kind of break it down into three buckets. You know, one, what are the markers that are more focused on endothelial function? So things that would impede nitric oxide production. Two, I look at all the inflammatory markers and the oxidative stress markers. You know, what are, you know, scratching up the arteries, making them more prime that things are going to stick there. And three is looking at the lipoproteins. So start with the endothelial one first. So nitric oxide, you can measure that, you know, indirectly by levels of ADMA, SDMA. You know, when those levels are high, you're likely to have low nitric oxide because they compete against an enzyme that allows nitric oxide to be made. High homocysteine will lower nitric oxide. High uric acid will lower nitric oxide. Uh, and then just having, you know, a high inflammatory burden will as well. So those are kind of the three quick checks on nitric oxide. The inflammatory cascade, you know, high sense of ECRP, you know, generally you want that to be under one consistently. If it's up one time, not a problem. It's just, if it's chronically elevated, that's a concern. But the more vascular specific inflammatory markers are going to be the uh, LP, PLA2. It's also known as the plaque test, PLAC. That's a marker that when it's elevated, tends to mean the intima is inflamed. You're more likely to be laying down plaque. There's a test called myeloperoxidase or MPO. Myeloperoxidase is found inside white blood cells. You know, it's essentially like bleach. So when the white blood cells go out to kill a bacteria, they drop myeloperoxidase on it. But if you have high myeloperoxidase, that myeloperoxidase can also damage your HDL particles. And if your HDL is damaged, one of its jobs is to reverse cholesterol transport, basically try to pull the cholesterol out of the plaques in the walls of the artery. Well, if HDL doesn't work, those plaques aren't going to be going anywhere anytime soon. There's a test that looks at your oxidative defenses. That's called F2 isoprostane creatinine. If you have low levels of F2 isoprostane over creatinine, you basically are not likely to rust from the inside out. If you have high levels of F2 isoprostane over creatinine, your oxidative burden is very high. Oxidation will lead to more inflammation and then the arteries are more on fire at that stage. Um, and then from a lipid standpoint, yeah, you know, everybody's probably had their traditional cholesterol panel looked at, but honestly, that does not predict risk very well. You know, the only thing that, you know, would kind of pique my interest is on a traditional panel is if your total cholesterol is over 300 milligrams per deciliter and your LDL cholesterol is over 190 milligrams per deciliter, then I'm more concerned that you might have FH or familial hyperlipidemia, which is not a one gene, one disease. It's just a phenotype. That's just the pattern. And then you got to do the genetic markers to figure out, okay, is there a uh, SNP that's actually driving up their, their lipoproteins? But in the traditional panel, yeah, I will look at the triglycerides and HDLC. That gives you a somewhat of an insight into if that person's metabolically healthy or not. Um, you know, if they have high triglycerides and low HDLC, they may be insulin resistant or pre-diabetic. And there's other tests that you can look at for that. But to your point, it's really about the particles or the lipoproteins. Mm. There's something called an LDL particle. There's HDL particles. Think about more the LDL particle being the you know more important story. We, we can talk about the HDL side in a second, but particles predict risk. And I explained to my patients in the office that the particles are like cargo ships. They're, you know, they're produced in the liver and they fill up full of cholesterol, triglycerides, which are energy for your cells, different phospholipids, which are building blocks for cells. And there's different proteins on the outside of these lipoproteins. The lipoproteins, you know, kind of look like a tennis ball and they're just going to be, you know, cargo vessels because cholesterol and triglycerides are fatty, waxy compounds. They will not float in the liquid blood. So they get put into these lipoproteins. Well, the liver then pumps these things out. And on the outside of the LDL particles is some called apolipoprotein B or ApoB for short. So on a tennis ball, that's essentially the white stripe on the tennis ball. It's structural in nature, keeps that lipoprotein into a sphere, but also acts like a ligand or a lock and key mechanism so that when the, that lipoprotein is floating through your blood vessels, it's looking for a, you know an off-ramp or you know a receptor to get out of the blood vessels. So maybe it wants to go deliver energy to your muscles. The muscles then will put out a receptor and then that ApoB particle will bind to that receptor. The muscle will basically download what it needs out of that particle and then eventually put it back in the blood vessels and send it to the liver. The second step is the liver has to put out its own LDL receptor and clear it from circulation. Some people lack that enzyme that really allows a lot of these receptors to stay out. So the particles just keep circulating around in the blood vessels looking for an off-ramp. And it's a shots on goal type of analogy. The longer they sit around or the longer residence time in the arteries, the more chances they can interact with the artery wall instead of going to where you want them to go. So I kind of make a caveat that like, there's no such thing as good cholesterol. There's no such thing as bad cholesterol. There's just cholesterol. There's different lipoproteins bearing it around your system. 
The only quote bad cholesterol would be the cholesterol that took the detour and was getting deposited into your artery walls. And that's always going to get deposited there by an ApoB containing particle. So that's the whole you know, impetus of that, you know, why people may want to consider being on some type of lipid lowering therapy is to lower those ApoB containing particles. It's not to necessarily lower the cholesterol, it's to lower the particles that are interacting with the artery wall. Okay, so that's a bit of a, there's a lot there. And I think people are I like your example of a fairy ship. But if we take that analogy for people to understand is sort of the way I explained it using cars. So you've got your, you know, your, your APOB, which is made up of your a very low density lipoprotein VDL, then you've got your LDL, you've got your RDL, and maybe even lipoprotein little A's also part of that APOB. So these are different cars on the road. Maybe we can use Toyota or they Volkswagen or something like that. They carrying cholesterol. The people in the cars are carrying cholesterol. The people that are carrying the cholesterol, the number, that's not important. It's the different types of cars on the road that are causing the problems. So when you've got a high APOB, which is something that a physician should do, I don't know from what age, but that's a very important mark in terms of causing atherosclerosis and future atherosclerosis. Is that correct? Would that be a good analogy there? That's a good analogy. And I use that one as well. It's, it depends on what people are you know, uh, used to me talking about, because sometimes I'll call it cars on the highway or cargo yeah. ships and riverways, you know, but it's a similar you know, idea that if it's a car, you know, what causes a traffic jam? Too many cars on the highway. It's not that, you know, you have two buses and they're full of a bunch of kids. Two buses aren't going to cause a traffic jam, but if you have 300 cars out there and they're each carrying one person, then the traffic jam happens in the artery walls, essentially. Mm -hmm. But then the car that makes the biggest damage is the lipoprotein little A. So maybe that's the Ferrari, that little lipoprotein little A. It might be a small concentration, but that's causing a lot of damage. So if you pick up lipoprotein little A, you've got to do something quickly. Then the VDL, the very low density lipoprotein, that's the second car that causes the most damage. Is that correct? So that's why you want to get particle number and size. Would that be correct for people to understand the process? So I think the first thing you said was about, was did you say LDL particle or LPA? I can't remember if you said that. protein but, little yeah. A being the okay. biggest damage, the, the, the biggest Correct. damage in causing. Right. But I think the, the one question though, is that they don't really know what receptor clears LP little A from the system. Yeah, you know, maybe it is the LDL receptor, but I think they're still really investigating that. So we'll do a quick side note on the LPA and then we'll jump back into okay. the, you know, the size of the particle and stuff. But LP little A, approximately 20% of the population has it. LPLA is very similar to the LDL particles. So again, the tennis ball analogy, it has an ApoB on the outside of it, but then also has an apolipoprotein A. You know, it kind of looks like a corkscrew and there's different Kringle lengths. You know, the shorter the Kringles, the more LPLA particles your bodies can pump out. The Kringles are like the corkscrew. As this LPLA particle is floating through your bloodstream, that corkscrew can interact with that endothelial glycocalyx. And when that happens, the LPLA, which is thought to be a scavenger molecule, it's looking to pick up these oxidized, you know, uh, phospholipids and other compounds that, you know, it's like toxic waste. The LPA is trying to go pick it up. But if the LPLA like, gets stuck in the artery wall, well, it's got like toxic waste and it's, you know, cargo. And now that's stuck in your artery wall. And that's going to cause a major immune response. So the key with LPLA is that there is no great treatments for it at this time. You know, there's drugs in development that, you know, can lower LPLA by 90% or greater but they're still doing the research to see, does it lower heart attacks, strokes, deaths? So the only thing you can do is note that somebody has LPLA and then try to cool down inflammation, oxidation, and try to treat all the other cardiovascular risk factors you can, including ApoB that's mostly on that LDL particle. And you'd mentioned, yes, the ApoB is on the VLDLs, it's on the IDLs, the LDL particles, but 90, 95% of it is on the LDL particles. So that's where you can really start the focus. And you mentioned there's different sizes of these particles. You know, the particles that are larger are going to be carrying more cholesterol. The particles that have less cholesterol have more protein. They're denser. You know, you tend to have the smaller, denser ones when you're insulin resistant. You know, you have more cars that are now going to be going around on your highway, essentially. And the smaller ones have a longer residence time. It's thought that maybe they stick around in the system for five days versus the large ones, which maybe stay one or two days. And you're breathing oxygen the entire time for those five days to make energy in your cells that oxygen can interact with those small lipoproteins and they may start rusting essentially. So the small ones are just a marker that the person may be insulin resistant or they have a genetic issue that they're just pumping out a lot of these small particles. But the total particle count is the more important thing to look at. 
I said total particle is more important than size in terms okay. of LDL. Okay, so that's a bit of a lipid uh, masterclass we're going to get there. How important is triglycerides? I know there's some debate. People think it was because of a high carbohydrate content that you got high tri triglycerides. There seems to be sort of some new research that's also about, you know, how much fat you're taking in. We've had Tim Lopes on the podcast twice. You know, I joked with Tim. I said, he's got the low carbohydrate, high fat diet, but I said, you've got to have the low carbohydrate, low fat, which is all the vegetable seed oils that people are having. That's called causing major insulin resistance, and then the high fat, the good fats that we need in our diets. But uh, maybe comment on in, uh, triglycerides, the importance of that, how people can lower that, and that's involvement with regards to cardiovascular disease. So the way I usually describe triglycerides to patients is that, you know, it's a energy source that you're going to use in the future. You know, if you don't have an immediate use for it, the body packages it up and it's shuttling it around to the rest of the organs. If you become insulin resistant, well, then really, you know, the only place that you're going to, you know, put these triglycerides are your fat cells, or it's going to be floating around in your blood. Uh, triglycerides, you know, by most labs here in the, the States, you know, they say you're under 150 is quote normal, but that's not optimal. Optimal is generally going to be less than 80. Um, and yes, you're right. You know, there is no perfect diet that you can say like it's hundred percent going to cause high triglycerides. So that's why I got a test. Don't guess type of philosophy, you know, people who have cytosterolemia and they absorb a lot of fat from their intestine, they're going to have to package that fat up into chylomicrons. Those go back to the liver. You're going to repackage it into VLDLs and then the VLDLs are going to break down to LDLs and you're going to have a lot of triglycerides going around in the system in those things. So yes, fats can directly lead to triglycerides being elevated, but it tends to be more carbohydrates. But then in the biohacking world, you know, too much blue light is also going to be stimulating, you know, triglyceride production. So it's complicated. Wow. Um, but if you have triglycerides, you have to figure out, is there something in your circadian rhythms, your blue light exposure, or is it more of a nutritional thing? And if it's nutritional, there's blood tests that can tell you, is this something that, you know, you have to change up the fat content or do you have to change up the quality of fats that you're getting? And where do you place the importance of having low triglycerides as a cardiologist with regards to, you know, just cardiovascular health? I mean, ApoB is going to be much higher than that, but I look at it as a marker of your metabolic health. You know, again, I would like to see almost everybody's triglycerides to be under 80. Mm. Tell us about the link about blue light and triglycerides. That's the first I've heard, you know, obviously interviewed Jack Cruz twice on the show. We've had Jack Wilson on the show. I've never known the link between, you know, artificial blue light and tri high triglycerides. My uh, understanding is that, is that the um, the pancreas and the liver, um, you know, basically get the wrong signals from too much exposure on the melanopsin receptor. And that's something that will help trigger that. You know, you're going to be also raising cortisol levels, which then raises blood sugar. And then the blood sugar ultimately kind of has to get repackaged up into triglycerides if you don't use that blood sugar for uh, immediate use. So at least sure. I think that's the, the, the linkage for it. Brilliant. We'll check that out. That's absolutely fascinating. Another reason to get triglycerides down. Uh, I know you had you were on with Dr. Gabriel on a brilliant podcast talking about protein, and she said, you know, Dr. Stuart Phillips on the show. I, I like the little acronym of low carbohydrate, low fat, high fat. I, I think the protein macronutrient is very, very important. There's a lot of debate about it. As a cardiologist, let's talk about protein where people should be looking at from a heart health perspective. So yes, my friend, Dr. Lyon, you know, she's an expert in what she uh, has, you know, deemed the term muscle centric medicine, you know, muscles are your organs of longevity, you know, 80% of your glucose is going to get disposed of in your muscle and insulin resistance starts in your muscles. So people who age well have healthy levels of muscle mass. And if you don't do something to take care of your muscles, you ultimately become sarcopenic. If you become sarcopenic where your muscles are essentially, you know, being degraded and you don't have much muscle mass then your metabolic engines aren't very active. You can't burn sugar very effectively for energy because you don't have the engines to do it. Um, and after the age of 40, you become anabolically resistant. So it's much harder to continue to add on muscle after the age of 40. You're just basically trying not to play a losing game. You can still add muscle on, but it's not as easy because your hormones aren't as vigorous at helping lay down muscle growth. So for muscle synthesis, uh, you have to do resistance or strength training, you know, two to three times a week. And then you have to get the right protein load to trigger muscle protein synthesis. And it's mainly about the amino acid leucine. Uh, and it's a meal threshold of leucine that you require. It generally needs to be around two grams per meal. Now it's a rough estimate that, you know, 30 grams of high quality protein is going to have about two grams of leucine in it. So 
from their kind of uh, data that 90 grams is probably the bare minimum people need to get that leucine threshold just to maintain the muscle mass that they have. If somebody's trying to add on more muscle mass, which you're not able to do if you're dieting, you know, you need a protein uh, load that's going to allow the muscles to have their building blocks to make more muscle units. You're going to generally want to be north of one gram per pound of your ideal body weight to make that happen. So protein becomes the kind of base macronutrient. Now, I know sometimes in the world of, you know, the biohackers and the quantum health people, they see, you know, talk about like food isn't important. Well, I don't say food's not important. You got to work on the circadian rhythm stuff first. Food is important, but you know, you have to be nuanced into the, the thinking about it. But you know, the macronutrient that most people will ignore because you know, they get in the fights on the carbohydrates and the fat side is they don't really look at getting the high quality protein because that is really the source of healthy muscles long term. Okay. So you've spoken about leucine. You said one gram per pound. Is that just a normal sort of protein that people should look look at? Is that lean? you know, uh, mass or, or what is it exactly with regards to how much they should be having in a, a daily basis and what source is it? Is it plant? Is it animal? What are your views? So it's, you know, it's one gram per year, ideal body weight. So, you know, most people are, you know, 20 or 30% body fat if they're not, uh, you know, a fitness competitor. So they take away to you know, subtract off 20% and that's about where you're going to want to, to hit. So it's not that you're generally going to overdose on protein per se. Yeah. But there'll be a, there will be a meal threshold where you're not going to like use more amino acids in it. So most people are sub threshold. So I wouldn't be worried about getting quote a little bit too much. Um, but sources are important, you know, high quality proteins, you know, are going to be nutrient dense. Now, can you do a plant-based? You can, you just have to eat larger volumes of plants to make that happen. So that's going to be more of the, uh, you know, pea proteins and those type of things are more energy dense. You know, Dr. Lyon used the analogy of, you know, uh, a chicken breast has the same amount of protein as six cups of quinoa. So quinoa, you know, is, you know, a large volume that you're going to put into your system. And that comes with a lot of other carbohydrates that your body's then going to have to handle at that time. Now it's possible. And there's other sources that you can do, but, you know, I would generally recommend people eat, you know, leaner sources of protein, you know, unless they know for sure that they can handle the, you know, the fatty loads of uh, things that are in their, their protein sources. When you say handle the fatty load, are they going to pick it up in their biomarkers that can handle it or how they're going to see whether they can handle this or just from feelings of nausea or they you know, can't produce enough bile or they feel quite liverish? How, how do they know they can handle the fat sources? Good, good point is that, you know, yeah, can they digest it? You know, because some people would definitely get, uh, you, know, you know, biliary colic if they're eating high fat diets and high protein. And then, you know, it's doing the biomarkers, you know, if you're an APOE4 genotype, you may not handle the highest fat loads. And then there's testing that can look at your sterile absorption. So if you're you know, hyper absorbing uh, beta cytosterol um, or lanthosterol, then you probably are not going to tolerate high fat diets. So you want to focus more on the lean cuts of protein in that case. Sure. Sounds fascinating. In terms of uh, body composition, uh, your view, it's something that we try and do often in terms of less on the weight, but the body composition, is this important for, for heart health uh, with regards to people doing the assessments? Sure. And that's the you know thing where, you know, if you have access to it, a DEXA scan is a good way to know, you know, what is, you know, your total lean body mass? What is your body fat percentage? You know, how healthy are your bones? Because your bones are like the scaffolding to hold onto your muscles. Mm -hmm. So DEXA is probably, I don't want to say it's the absolute gold standard, but it's the one that most people have access to, to figure out what their true body fat percentage is. Because the weight you see on the scale isn't nearly as important as what that muscle mass actually is. Um, and, you know, you know, it's normal to have some body fat percentage, you know, the body fat is, you know, a, you know, evolutionary mechanism to store calories and energy for when there's times of famine. So it's not normal to be 5% body fat all the time. Um, but when you have, you know, 30, 40% body fat, well, that's going to tend to be more pro-inflammatory. You put all your toxins and things that you can't deal with, you shove it into your fat cells. So like, we'll deal with this later. So, you know, the, the fat cells are basically an endocrine organ. They're releasing other uh, compounds that can, can contribute to more inflammation. So it's not just a, you know, hunk of flesh hanging on your body. It's an endocrine thing that can potentially cause more issues with your cardiovascular system because, you know, the 60,000 miles of blood vessels are carrying all these, you know, cytokines and such through them and the blood vessels get damages the innocent bystanders. So I don't personally have an exact body fat percentage. I'm telling every patient to try to shoot for, but, you know, it's good to, you know, test, don't guess. And, you know, if you're, you know, you know, as a man, you know, if your number is 30%, that's probably too high. Now you got to figure out what you want it to be 
should be lower, but you really focus on the, the side of, you know, the muscle health less than the fat, you know, Dr. Lyon here saying also is, you know, people aren't necessarily over fat, they're under muscled. So focus on the muscle side of the story first, and if the muscles are healthier, they will then help beta oxidize the rest of that fat mass. Brilliant. And just in terms of asked this question, I know it's, it's sort of a difficult one to answer. It's sort of vague, but is it worth it for people who can't afford good quality sort of red meat, like grass fed, grass finished? Is it more damaging to them to eat industrialized raised uh, meat or should they, you know, avoid it totally if they cannot afford grass fed, grass finished? It's a great question. I mean, you know, quality does matter. Um, you know, you are what your animal eats, essentially. So, you know, uh, you know if you listen to, you know, uh, Jack Cruz enough, you know, he's always talking about redox before you detox. So, so if your mitochondria are extremely healthy, you're able to handle a higher, you know, uh, you know, inflammatory load, essentially. So if you're getting more toxins in the system, your body's able to clear that stuff out. So the sicker you are, the, you know, it's kind of like the, the pendulum, the sicker you are, you're going to spend more of your resources to try to get well. If you're well, well, it's ideal is don't try to break down, but you can get away with a little bit more. So it is individualized, but the protein is going to be more important than exactly what else might be coming with it. So um, I would focus on, you know, trying to keep the muscles healthy and, you know, do all the other things we've been chatting about, you know, get some morning sun, optimize your sleep, do all those things that can potentially help with any quote toxins your body's getting exposed to. So I just want to ask you questions and questions. You're a wealth of knowledge. I really appreciate just who you are, your dedication to preventative health and that. But omega-6, omega-3, we send a test to Norway. We find that that's pretty important. People don't have enough omega-3s in the diets and look at sort of the ev evolutionary changes that we've had with all these industrial seed oils that are causing a lot of problems. We obviously need essential fatty acids, omega-6s, but we're getting way too many in the diet. Uh, there's a huge cry out for many people in the carnival community or the paleo community saying we're not getting enough omega-3s. We're getting way too many omega-6s. I've probably done over a thousand tests here in the practice showing that most people have a 21 to 20 to 1 ratio, 30 to 1, sometimes highest 80 to 1 ratio. What's your view on the ratio and the volume in terms of omega-3s and omega-6s? So that's a number that I will routinely check. And there's different labs here that have some slightly different cutoffs for the percentage of the omega check is what the one will call and the one's called the omega quant. But that's looking at just more the omega three side of things, which I think is important. But I think the ratio may be a, a better tell on what that person's getting in their environment. So as you mentioned, your omega sixes are essential, but most people are getting way too many and they're not getting enough omega threes. And when I say omega threes, I'm talking about the cold water fish, the shellfish, you know, it's not popping a bunch of omega three pills. You know, you want to be ideally getting this from your diet and a ratio where I would, you know, want it to be, would be, you'd have an omega six to omega three ratio of approximately four to one or less. Now I've not seen an 80 to one, but I, yeah, many patients in, you know, the upper teens to you know, the low twenties where they got 20 times more omega sixes than threes. And it's often that they're not eating any seafood. So at least start there is try to get more seafood into their diet and that can balance things out and then educate them about like, you know, you know, the seed oils and such. Yeah. You know, I'm not such a zealot that say like, you know, you can't have anything, but you know, if your numbers are 20 to one, you know, where are you getting those sources is the, the question people need to ask is like, if they're eating meals out, if they're eating a bunch of packaged foods, you have to learn to read the ingredients, you know, quality matters. So you ideally want to start cutting down on the six side of things, but really be increasing the three to help balance things out. As a cardiologist, in terms of EPA and DHA, these essential fatty acids, what role do they play with regard to heart health? So it, it's a little bit more complicated this, but I usually tell people like the EPA side of things is a little bit more important for the arterial health, has a little bit more effect on the triglycerides and such. And the DHA, while it does have this, some effect on the lipids, that's much more about, you know, neuro health, you know, the, the DHA, uh, you know, from the, the quantum health people, that's essentially the insulation for your nerves. So when you're exposed to sunlight, if you have DHA in your retina and eye, you can take that sunlight and then transmit that energy down to your mitochondria. If you don't have enough DHA, it's kind of like having a half charged phone. It's going to work for a while, but you don't have a full charge that you can deliver full power to every cell at the same time. So low DHA, you're going to start having brownouts in certain, you know, organs and your brain and heart are the most energy dense organs. So higher DHA, the better those organs tend to run. 
Brilliant. So now just coming to the end of the show, I want to know about Dr. Michael Twyman's, you know, daily routine, weekly routine, mm-hmm. monthly routine. We can't fit everything into a day. You know, when I look at my execs and they say, listen, what should I do every day? There's certain things that are crucial that you want to do every day, certain things every week, every month, maybe every quarter. But let's look at someone who's, you know, I, I've been in the practice so long, seeing a lot of clients. They remind me of what happens when we don't do these daily, weekly, monthly things. It's a constant reminder, which I'm, I'm grateful for help a lot of people, but at least I'm reminded of what happens when you don't put things in place, things go really pear shaped. So let us know about your daily and weekly and monthly routine. Sure. And I you know, just want to thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to your audience about this topic mm-hmm. and that I'm not anything special. You know, I'm not doing, you know, 10,000 biohacks a day to try to stay healthy. I mean, I'm going to teach you the basics and, you know, there's things that can help from a biohacking world and self-quantification world that can kind of get you on the right track, but start with the basics. You know, I always frequently talk about a, a four-legged stool, you know, there's exercise and nutrition. And we talked about some of those things in this mm-hmm. chat. Those are important, but also talk about stress management and sleep. If you don't get those things right, it doesn't almost matter how clean you eat or how much exercise you do, because you're not going to repair from the damage of yeah. eating or exercising. So we got to focus on kind of those four areas. But a you know, quote normal day for myself is I'm usually up before 5 a.m. And that's going to be before the sunrise here. So when I'm up before five, you know, I'm wearing my blue blocking glasses inside. You know, I have different red light bulbs in the house so that I don't have any bright blue light on in the morning time. You know, I try not to use a lot of technology in the morning before the sun rises. I will always meditate in the morning time. It's just how I built it into my routine. And that helps, you know, you know, train your vagus nerve. You know, it helps you with those fight or flight situations, which are all normal. I tell people stress is normal, but you have to have some way that you can help manage that stress. So people are used to going to the gym to work out their muscles. You have to also work out your vagus nerve if you want to be optimal. Then the sun rises. I go outside for approximately four to five minute walk. I'm usually wearing some type of earthing grounding shoes if I can't be barefoot and get 45 minutes of light directly into my eye. So no glasses when I'm on side. Then I usually will eat within that first hour of the sun breaking the horizon. And I try to eat decently seasonally um, and switch things up. Yeah, so right now it's kind of more of a you know, berry focused protein smoothie. And then in the you know uh, winter time when you know, fruit isn't readily available in this region, switch up to more kind of like an egg sausage casserole big breakfast, get that, you know, 30 to 45 grams of protein to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Mm. Um, now I do drink some coffee, just more, I just like the, uh, the experience of making it more than anything. I don't necessarily need the caffeine to, to function. Um, but I also did genetic testing and know that I'm a fast metabolizer of caffeine. So it doesn't affect my blood pressure and doesn't affect my sleep. Mm. Then, you know, come into work generally about nine o'clock in the morning, start seeing patients, teaching them the things that we chatted about today. And then when I get home, uh, in the afternoon, you know, that's generally the time I'll exercise um, and kind of have a mix of doing some cardiorespiratory fitness, you know, usually on a, a bike, um, do a lot of zone two training just to help mitochondrial, you know, function at, you know, basically beta oxidation, and then do some resistance training a couple times a week. I have some variable resistance bands and kettlebells at home. I just personally don't like working out in gyms. I don't want to work out in a bunch of artificial blue lights. I want to try to control the light environment as best I can. Ideally, I'd work outside if I could, um, but if I can't, then I have it inside, windows cracked, and then I have my photomodulation panels on, you know, trying to support some of the red light into the room. And then usually I'll finish dinner, you know, six o'clock and uh, kind of wind down for the night, do some reading, watch some, you know, YouTube educational videos or something like that, hang out with family, talk to friends. Yeah. You know, last night I played some pickleball, which is great fun. People uh, yeah. haven't tried it yet, try some pickleball. Yeah. And then usually in bed, you know, by 9.30, 10 o'clock at the latest. So usually get at least seven, eight hours of sleep every night. So that's the routine. It's, you know, setting up an optimal circadian day and just trying to repeat that as many times as possible. Mm. Now you'd mentioned, you know, there's times and places to go do other things. So on the weekends, do some more like forest bathing, go for longer walks in the, in the forest, you know, for the biohack stuff, like to do the float tanks, the isolation tanks. So go lay in some warm magnesium water. It's good to meditate in there, soak up some magnesium, think about the world or just relax. And, you know, those are the the main things I tend to do. Brilliant. We've got through so much, Dr. Michael Twyman. You are courageous as a cardiologist. Uh, You and Dr. Jack Wilson are my favorite cardiologists. We've got some (laughs) functional medicine cardiologists in South Africa that are growing, but they're not the biohacking level that you're at. So thank you so much. Is there anything we haven't covered that you'd like to leave a message of hope? You know, uh, COVID, unfortunately, is a lot of despair. There's a lot of enslavement, uh, you know, to, to financial institutions, debt and stress and, you know, a lot of enslavement with regards to big 
big pharma. You know, pharmaceuticals have their place, but it's not the first port of call that I want patients and clients and people listening to go to. That's why we're trying to empower people. But is there a message of hope for people that they can listen to from yourself as a cardiologist? For sure. And, you know, it's mainly that, you know, heart attacks are definitely preventable. And the majority of things that can help prevent it are generally free or very low cost. You know, you're in charge of your health. You know, your doctor is not in charge of your health. You know, you want your doctor there to be as a educator or something really kind of goes off the rails that can put you back on the rails, but you're in charge of your health. You're in charge of your circadian rhythms, you know, what you're fueling the body with mentally or, you know, actual food. You're in charge of your physical activities. You're in charge of your stress. You're in charge of your sleep quality. Those things determine 90% of the story. Your doctor is important to kind of help you, but you're in charge. And that's basically was laid out in, during COVID. You know, when the world shut down and you were stuck in your home, you had to know what to do for yourself. You know, the hospitals are there if things you know, were really, really bad. But I think people, if they really got into these routines, you make yourself more resilient. You know, you're less likely to get you know, the next round of whatever you know, COVID there's going to be. But you're also much less you know, likely to have a cardiovascular event. So you know, test don't guess. And you're able to kind of figure out how to optimize your health and longevity. Brilliant. Well, I declare favor and blessing over you from the Made to Thrive team. If we can support you in any way, we've got beautiful nine coaches, consultants online that are trying to bridge the gap between physician and patient and client to empower them to make the decisions that they need to do to take accountability for their own health. So thank you so much. I just trust that you go from strength to strength, that you live out your desires and your purpose and your calling. And so thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you.